Welcome to Proactive Management of Diabetes, using care plans and the diabetes cycle of care to improve health outcomes. My name is Magali De Castro, and I'm a primary care nurse consultant and clinical director at HotDoc. The aim of this CPD module is to provide you with the tools and practical information to enhance the way care is provided to patients with type 2 diabetes. Taking part in this training is a great way to ensure your clinic is providing services as per the current diabetes management guidelines, and it also gives you an opportunity to check if your clinic is currently making best use of the available Medicare items and practice incentives, or if there might still be some room for improvement. This CPD module is divided into three sections. First is an overview of diabetes in Australia, including best practice guidelines. Second section is requirements of relevant Medicare items for care planning and the diabetes cycle of care. And in the third section, we'll look at practice systems to engage patients, track and monitor progress, and provide support with self-management. Throughout the module, we have also included tips and insights from other practitioners and allied health providers, which we hope you'll find beneficial and which highlight the importance of working as part of a multidisciplinary team. In the next video, we'll discuss type 2 diabetes in Australia, and we'll take a closer look at the current best practice management guidelines. As you're probably aware, the number of people with type 2 diabetes is growing rapidly in Australia, and it's currently the 10th leading cause of death. This is likely the result of a considerable rise in obesity rates, lifestyle and dietary changes, as well as the aging population that we have. Within 20 years, it's estimated that the number of people in Australia with type 2 diabetes is going to increase from approximately 870,000 in 2014 to over 2.5 million. We also know that the most socially disadvantaged Australians are twice as likely to develop diabetes. If left undiagnosed or poorly managed, type 2 diabetes can lead to coronary artery disease, stroke, kidney failure, limb amputations and blindness. The biggest challenge of managing diabetes is having people change their lifestyle rather than assuming that just a tablet is going to fix their problem. Getting them to understand that it's a chronic relapsing condition and unless they continue with their lifestyle changes and or medications, the natural history of this condition is to deteriorate and to lead to other problems. This is why early diagnosis and optimal management of people with type 2 diabetes is critical. General practice has a key role in type 2 diabetes, from identifying those at risk right through to caring to patients at the end of life. For GPs and nurses, they're in an ideal situation to be able to look after the patient because they see them all the time. So they're able to build up a rapport to actually work with the patient. So they have got the time to start off and explain to them what diabetes is, why it's important to look after it, and then make sure they attend for regular review. So that way they build up a relationship and they can work together. This training module is based on the current guidelines for general practice management of type 2 diabetes. This valuable resource can be accessed free of charge via the RICGP website and card copies can be ordered from Diabetes Australia. Now, what is diabetes? The term diabetes covers a group of disorders. There are four clinical classes of diabetes. Type 1 diabetes, which results from beta cell destruction due to an autoimmune process, usually leading to insulin deficiency. Type 2 diabetes results from a progressive insulin secretory defect on the background of insulin resistance. Gestational diabetes, which is any degree of glucose intolerance with onset or first recognition during pregnancy. And finally, there are other specific types of diabetes due to causes such as genetic defects in the beta cell function or um, drug or chemically induced um, causes such as in the treatment of HIV AIDS or after organ transplantation. In this training, we'll focus on type 2 diabetes, which is a largely preventable, chronic and progressive medical condition. And it largely occurs as a result of modifiable lifestyle-related risk factors interacting with genetic risk factors. Okay, so the biggest challenge that I'm finding is people don't see it as serious. They don't feel unwell when they've got type 2 diabetes. Quite a lot of the time they're told they've got a bit of sugar, and so it doesn't matter. They don't need to look after it. So they don't really understand what diabetes is, or how it's going to impact on their life, and they think if they just don't eat sugar, they're going to be fine. Throughout this training and all through the guidelines and as part of the current health community, you will hear the term patient-centered care a fair bit. The concept of patient-centered care incorporates the patient's experience of care and looks at the patient as a partner in their health care. In practice, this means providing care that is respectful and responsive to the patient's preferences, needs and values, and ensures that it is these values that guide all clinical decisions, which in turn supports patients with self-management. To me, that's really a service geared just around the patient's needs, not just around 
what is important from a doctor's point of view for billing, at allied health for billing, it is customized just to that patient. So it is geared to their needs and only their needs. So if they don't, if they've got a great diet, they've got everything like that, well, they don't need to see a dietitian, irrespective of what our plans and management plans often have geared in them. It's geared to just their needs right now. Um, and it's customized to each different person. So it's not one fits all. Patient-centered care to me means that the patient's in the middle, the very center of the care. So you say to the patient, what do you want to get out of seeing me today? Where would you like to be in five years? What's important to you? And then you can work with them from that point. Understanding a patient's experiences in regards to their diabetes, but also including other comorbidities, can improve communication and help us understand their priorities for education, for resources, and for management. This is essential for building and adapting diabetes management plans so that they're consistent with an individual patient's needs. As a general rule, I always like to ask patients what they feel is the biggest issue affecting their health at the moment. I have yet to find one patient who says, you know what, I think my biggest issue is my HbA1c. If only I could get on top of that, I'd be much better. The reality is, the more common responses are going to be around living with pain, problems with sleep, feeling tired, stressful life circumstances. And the idea is that if we acknowledge these um, issues and we incorporate them into the plan, we're going to have much more engaged patients because they're going to see the care as much more relevant to their needs. Diagnosis of diabetes. An area worth reviewing is how a diagnosis of diabetes is made. The guidelines have a handy screening and diagnosis algorithm, but in short, diabetes is likely in instances where fasting blood glucose is equal or over 7.0 millimolitre on two separate occasions, or a two hour reading after an oral, uh, an oral glucose tolerance test is equal or above 11.0 millimolitre on two separate occasions, or if the HbA1c is equal or above 6.5% or 48 millimolitre on two separate occasions. Now let's look at how patient health literacy affects diabetes outcomes. Health literacy refers to a patient's ability to read, understand and use healthcare information to make decisions and follow instructions for treatment. In 2006, the Australian Bureau of Statistics identified that half of healthcare clients lacked sufficient health literacy to successfully navigate the health system. This means that simply providing brochures and written information does not necessarily translate to health education, and it is by itself unlikely to change any patient health behaviors. Evidence suggests that a patient's health literacy typically improves through self-education and continuing meaningful contact with health providers. We constantly find that the patients who do best are the ones who are seen more frequently and therefore seeing them on a regular basis, focusing on their problems, discussing their issues and getting them to feed back to you rather than actually being a demagogue and telling them what you must do, hearing their problems, their lifestyle issues and the things that are happening within their family in order to find out the best way that you can help that particular patient. As mentioned previously, patient-centred consultations involve assessing the patient's clinical signs and symptoms, as well as their thoughts, fears, preferences and expectations, and taking that into consideration within their social context. The idea is to get a complete understanding of the individual who's living with type 2 diabetes. Studies show that patient-centered management plans are more likely to be adhered to and result in better health outcomes. One of the worst things with diabetes is that people get told off all the time. So when they see their doctor, they're told their numbers aren't good, they shouldn't be doing this, they shouldn't be doing that, and they need to do more of this. And personally, if I went to someone and they started telling me off, I wouldn't go back. What you need to do is actually say to them, this is where we are, this is what we need to work on, let's work together. What would you like to work on today? So you get the patient engaged because you're working with them. I think engaging them is really important at a patient level. So when they're there speaking to them and encouraging them, it's really easy to write a plan. Well, it's not that easy, but it's easy enough to create the plan. Um, but explaining to the patient what they're getting out of it, what they're doing, so that when they do go to an allied health, they're actually wanting to do it, wanting it for their own health, not just my doctor sent me here, which is the most common you'll get and then that person needs to be coached and engaged 
So you're already wasting one or two sessions to get there. And I think that's probably the biggest because as Allied Health, we don't see that person without that either person coming in on a referral or being engaged. Um, if they're already engaged, that's the easiest part to get them through. Now, let's look at goals for optimum management of type 2 diabetes. We should encourage all people with type 2 diabetes to approach or reach the following goals. In terms of diet, we want to encourage normal healthy eating. In terms of body mass index or BMI, the therapeutic goal is 5 to 10% loss for people who are overweight or obese. In terms of physical activity, we'd be aiming for at least 30 minutes of moderate physical activity on most if not all days of the week for a total of 150 minutes per week. In terms of cigarette consumption, obviously we want none. Alcohol consumption should be less than two standard drinks per day for men and women. In terms of blood glucose level, we want to aim for 6 to 8 millimolar fasting and 8 to 10 millimolar random. Now, routine monitoring of blood glucose in low-risk patients who are using oral glucose-lowering drugs is not recommended. HbA1c needs to be individualized according to the patient's circumstances, but generally we'd be aiming for equal or less uh, than 53, um, which, uh, with a range of 48 to 58, or less than 7% with a range of 65 to 7.5%. For total cholesterol, we'd be aiming for less than 4.0. With HDL, we'd be aiming for over or equal to 1.0. With LDL, we'd be aiming for less than 2.0. With triglycerides, we'd be aiming for less than 2.0. Blood pressure, the goal would be 130 on 80. With urinary albumin excretion, Timed overnight collection would be less than 20, spot collection less than 20, with urinary albumin to creatine ratio, women would be less than 3.5 and men less than 2.5. In terms of vaccinations, we want to consider immunization against influenza and pneumococcal disease and also considering a um, DTPA vaccine. Now, managing glycemia. The aim of glycemic control is to avoid hyperglycemia and hypoglycemia and prevent and manage glycemic complications of diabetes. Overall, however, managing cardiovascular risk is a higher priority than strict glycemic control. Now, here are some recommendations. HbA1c measurement should be used to assess long-term blood glucose control. Self-monitored blood glucose is recommended for patients with type 2 diabetes who are using insulin, where the patients have been educated in appropriate alterations in insulin dose. Routine self-monitoring of blood glucose in low-risk patients who are using oral glucose-lowering drugs is usually not recommended. Another recommendation is that interventions should begin with lifestyle modification followed by pharmacological options selected on the basis of the individual's clinical circumstances. We have to also take into consideration side effects and contraindications. Adults with a high absolute risk of cardiovascular disease should be simultaneously treated with lipid and blood pressure lowering pharmacotherapy in addition to lifestyle advice unless contraindicated or clinically inappropriate. Now glucose lowering agents will not be covered in detail as part of this module, however you can refer to section 8.3 of the guidelines for a comprehensive algorithm. In this video we'll cover the relevant Medicare items for chronic disease management, which apply to the care of patients with diabetes. Keep in mind that this is an overview of the key item numbers we use as part of care planning, along with what the Medicare audit requirements are. So let's take a look at GP management plans and team care arrangements and the use of Medicare item numbers for the care of patients with diabetes. Now, when we look at Medicare items for the management of diabetes, um, patients with diabetes, the first component or the foundation component is what's called a GP management plan or GPMP for short. The item number is seven to one and a few conditions have to be met for a patient to be eligible to um, have this item be claimed. The first condition is the patient has to have a chronic illness and as per Medicare requirements, a chronic illness or chronic condition is one that is likely to last six months or more or is terminal and um, diabetes definitely falls within that category. So we've got, if we've got a patient who um, has diagnosed type 2 diabetes or type 1 diabetes, it we're fine to go ahead and create a GPMP for them. The other requirements um, that need to be met uh, for a GPMP is for once we identify that they're eligible because they've got a chronic condition, 
We need to identify what are the problems or needs that the patient has. And obviously remembering how we were talking about patient-centered care. Um, when we look at the patient-centered care, this is not just us in isolation identifying what the patient needs and um, their problems or issues are. This is a conversation. It's a two-way um, conversation with the patient um, and getting them as well to identify what they perceive are their needs and their issues and their challenges. So we need to identify what are the problems, needs, issues. Then we need to identify some goals. So how do we want those um, problems and needs and issues to resolve, ideally? Then we need to come up with some patient actions. Again, this is all done in collaboration with the patient. So for example, um, uh, a problem or need that a diabetic patient might have is um, they might have difficulties controlling their um, blood glucose levels. Um, for example, their HbA1c, which obviously, this is obviously a very um, uh, medical uh, need, identified need. So we could say one of the issues is um, staying on top of the HbA1c. A goal would be to um, bring that HbA1c or maintain, maintain it below 7%. Then a patient action around this would be more around what, what is it that the patient can do um, to uh, to help with their HbA1c and obviously there would be things like adhering to the um, diet regime as discussed with ourselves or the dietitian, um, uh, physical activity, um, the um, taking their medication, so all these things that we're putting in place, those are all patient actions. So that's what's the patient doing to support this goal or address that need or issue. Then we have to come up with some treatments or what I like to call what we're doing about it. Um, so this could be things like uh, we are going to be monitoring uh, that patient every three months or every six months. We're going to be measuring that HbA1c once a year at a minimum, or we might decide that we're going to do it every six months or um, sooner. We might, um, as part of the treatment, we might also arrange um, other services. We might arrange a referral to a dietitian. We might arrange um, a referral to an endocrinologist. So those are all treatments or um, arrangements that we can do. Then the final component is we need to identify a date of review. So this is, in my opinion, the most important element um, of a uh, manage ma management plan because there's no point in putting a plan in place if we're not actually ever going to, um, to review whether or not we're getting closer, further away from those goals that we set out to achieve. So the review date um, is usually, for the majority of patients, is gonna be every six months. Um, patients who are fairly complex, uh, you might actually do from three months. So Medicare will pay the item from three months uh, after the original date that the plan is built, but the expectation is that the majority of patients are really going to be a six monthly um, review basis. Um, the review item is 732, and what do we do as part of a review? As part of a review, obviously, we, we're going to re examine. Um, obviously, it's, does the patient still have that chronic illness? Yes. Um, diabetes is unlikely to go away, unfortunately. We'll look at the, um, those problems and needs that we originally identified. Are they still there? Are they still an issue? And we'll look at the goals. Are we getting closer or further away from, from those goals that we identified? Patient actions. How's the patient um, talking along with the things that you know, we've agreed that they would be doing? So how are they going with their managing their diet, managing their medication, attending uh, appointments that we've, um, or referrals, or services with other providers? Um, in terms of treatment, are the treatments that we set out to do um, still appropriate? Are we going to continue with those? Do we need to update any um, information in terms of do we have new, um, new results that we need to update? Are they due for um, a new, say, are they due for a measurement of HbA1c again? In which case we need to then initiate that, that service. Um, and then as part of that, obviously, we would do it in collaboration with the patient. Remember, it's always a two-way um, street. Um, and then we'd look at what's the next date of review. So as I said, we'd be reviewing the items every six months or every three months if you've got a patient who's fairly complex. Often also newly diagnosed diabetics, they could benefit from more intensive care um, at the start to make sure that they're understanding um, their condition and that the services are in place, so diabetes education, dietitian, exercise physiology, all these um, services. Um, so, so that would be done on a three monthly basis for a newly diagnosed often, or it can be six monthly. Um, and then the item number, as I said, is 732. 
Now, having this GP management plan and doing the GP management plan reviews doesn't necessarily give the patient access to um, those subsidized um, allied health um, services, except for one that I'm going to, well, actually two that I'm going to mention in a little bit. So those, those um, allied health sessions that you hear a lot about, the, you know, the physio sessions and the, the, um, the podiatry sessions, they really come in place, into play with the next um, component, which is what we call a team care arrangement. Now, the, this is only for patients who are complex, um, who, uh, on whose condition requires input from a multidisciplinary team. So this means at least two other providers in addition to the GP who provide different services. So team care arrangement or TCA for short, the item number is 723. And this is looking at well, who else is involved in the care of this patient. So it's often going to be allied health, especially with diabetics. So it could include um, exercise physiologists, podiatrist, uh, dietitian, diabetes educator, physio, um, uh, asthma, asthma educators. Um, and you can actually include specialists um, as well. But for the core team of providers, only one specialist counts. So if they've got an endocrinologist, fantastic. That's one of the two providers. But we also need to have at least one um, allied health as part of this um, service. Now, one of the limitations or one of the requirements of the team care arrangement is that we need to have um, two-way communication with the provider. So it's not just a matter of us deciding, fantastic, you're going to see the podiatrist and the dietitian. I'm going to uh, fill out some referrals and I'm going to claim that item. That's, it's not that simple. We actually need to gain consent and input from the other um, providers. So this is often achieved, the, the preferred way is uh, oral or verbal um, input. So in an ideal world, we'd be able to, and this is easier if you're co-located, have a chat to that allied health provider or um, that specialist and say, look, I've got Mrs. Smith here. She's a newly diagnosed diabetic. Um, what are the things if, you know, say if we've got a dietitian, for example, what are some of the things that you could be, um, that you know, you'd like to, that you'd be able to work with Mrs. Smith? On. So the dietitian might say, "Look, mom, I think we can do a um, um, we can do a training session. We'll I'll, I'll assess her current diet, and then we can actually come up with a, a training session or a plan to manage her um, dietary intake. So this might be teaching her about low glycemic foods and what are the best um, what are the best food types for um, blood sugar management." which obviously will take some time. So what, that's one of the other requirements. With the, with the providers that we engage as part of a team care arrangement, it can't be for a one-off service that's not likely to ever um, have a recurring need for that service. So this is really for providers who are going to be involved on a regular basis, at least over the next year. So again, not for one-offs. People, this is for providers who are going to be involved uh, ongoingly, but also we need to have that agreement from them. What a lot of clinics do is obviously if they can't establish that verbal um, agreement and input, then they'll send a fax. So they'll send a fax or send it in the post, or they'll send a, a letter and a referral letter, and they'll ask to please tick um, and, and agree to participate in the care of the patient. But make sure if this is what you're doing, you have to provide a space or an area for that provider um, to say what their input is going to be. So what is it that they're going to be working on with this patient? As an example, there's many reasons why we could refer someone to a dietitian. Um, to a dietitian. A dietitian might be looking at weight management, or they might be helping with food intolerances, they might be helping with a low glycemic in index diet or a diabetic diet. Um, same with if we send somebody to a podiatrist, we could be sending someone to a podiatrist for um, a diabetic, comprehensive diabetic foot check. Um, we could be sending someone to a podiatrist because they're just needing um, support with uh, uh, care care of their feet, so they might need um, assistance with their nails being trimmed or um, checking for peripheral neuropathy. Or there's, there's many reasons why. Um, so this is where it's important to identify specifically for this patient what is the care that's going to happen. A lot of practices will attach the um, a copy of the plan when they send the uh, the referral and get the the allied health to agree that yes. That's, that's fine, I'm happy to participate. And yes, the input um, or my care will be along the lines of what's identified in the plan, or here's some additional um, components that I would like to be looking after for this particular patient. Um, 
So yeah, so that's a very important thing to remember. Now, when we're looking at reviewing the team care arrangement, usually we'd review the team care arrangement and the GPMP together, because um, oftentimes in, the easiest thing is to actually have them as part of the one document. You don't have to create two separate documents for this. Um, you can actually just have the team care arrangement at the bottom of your GPMP documentation. The review would be in six months, so this, you, you'd ideally try and keep them um, going at the same time. Another key thing to remember is, as we said, it's two-way communication, so the team care arrangement component, so that's 723, should not be claimed until we've received correspondence back or we've, we've actually had the phone conversation or verbal conversation with that provider and we've noted that in the um, in the documentation. Yeah? So we can only claim that 723 once that two-way communication has happened. This is not uh, waiting for a full report to come back from the, the allied health professional or, or the specialist. This is just agreeing on um, providing care for the patient and what specifically is it that they're going to be um, looking at or, or um, doing uh, with, with this patient. So again, so we do this, um, the review would be at six monthly um, intervals. The review item is also 732. So if we are reviewing uh, the plan for a diabetic patient and they have both a GP management plan and a team care arrangement, and we're reviewing both elements, then we claim item 732 twice. And um, there's a couple of, um, there's often surprises some providers because they don't realize that they can actually claim it twice if you're indeed uh, reviewing both components. Make sure, however, that when you when you put the claiming through, it has to go very clearly annotated that one 732 item is for the GP management plan and the other one is for the uh, team care arrangement. Um, and it often, depending on your, on your admin software, will need to be ticked with a manual override so you can actually have that uh, note. The combination of these two items, so the 721 and the 723, is what, um, what allows patients access to those allied health, fund the Medicare subsidized allied health services. Keep in mind that these are not free services. Not all allied health providers are going to fully bulk bill those services. And there's many reasons for that. Um, one of them being that the, the amount that Medicare pays is around the $50 mark. And it's, it's for a lot of, uh, it varies depending on the allied health provider, <clears throat> as in the, dif the discipline, but for a lot of them it's actually not viable to run, because a lot of times their initial consultation is you know up to an hour, um, and it's not actually viable to just simply bulk bill uh, the, the consult, um, because they're actually going to be out of pocket or losing money. So always be mindful to let patients know to check. Don't sell it as a, there's going to be a free service. It's not a free service. There's some Medicare subsidy towards it. Some providers will be able to bulk bill. Other providers will actually have a gap um, pay, payment or an out-of-pocket payment. So the, um, the GP management plan team care arrangement combo, it used to be called EPC. You might still hear that term around, but that's actually really outdated terminology. I just like to mention it just in case you, because sometimes I like how providers will hear it, like we'll, we'll call it that way. So that was the old term. Um, but yeah, it just refers to the combination of that GP management plan and the team care arrangement. The new term is CDM for chronic disease management. So they're CDM um, items, or chronic disease management Medicare items. So in terms of what they allow the patient access to, it's five allied health services per calendar year. So that's five allied health services in total, um, not five per discipline. So if, if a patient's needing to have multiple, um, to see multiple providers, they have to decide, and this is done in collaboration with the GP or the practice nurse, they have to decide how they're going to allocate those five visits. So they might decide maybe we'll spend um, two with the podiatrist and three with the diabetes educator, or, or we'll maybe allocate one to the dietitian and um, four to the exercise physiologist. So again, part of the education process with the patients is, is making sure that they understand that there's a limited number of these subsidized um, or partially subsidized, I should say, sessions. Um, and that they have to kind of use them wisely. And it doesn't matter if we put, you know, review items or anything like that. If in any given calendar year, so from the 1st of January to the 31st of December, Medicare will only ever pay up to five of these allied health services. 
There's no real way of getting them to pay any more, no matter what item number you try and put in, in place. The other item that's worth noting is a nurse monitoring and support item, 10997. And this item is separate to the five uh, allied health sessions. So this is more like a nurse consult. And this is with the practice nurse at a clinic um, where we would be looking at uh, supporting the patient with um, things that have been identified as part of their plan. So for example, if you talked about blood pressure, uh, uh, optimal management of blood pressure, uh, or we talked about um, adhering to medication, then the nurse could actually have those support conversations or nurse consults throughout the year, up to five, um, that are completely separate to the allied health services and i think the rebate is around 12 dollars, and then you get the additional bulk billing um, incentive if it applies to that patient so it can actually come up to 18 dollars or so um, but just be mindful if if you um, as a nurse or if your nurses are using this item they have to they have to be in line with what's identified in the care plan but also a uh, progress note entry should be made um, for, e for that day, whenever you claim that item. The GP doesn't have to see the patient on that day, um, but again, obviously, if the nurse picks up something that is, that is urgent or needs to be dealt with by the doctor, then that should be referred on. But as a general rule, these are nurse consults, essentially, and they can be yeah, up to five in, a, in any calendar year period, 1st of January to 31st of December. Um, the GP doesn't have to see the patient on that day and, um, and only a GP management plan is needed. So you can actually use this for patients who only have the GPNP, that 7 to 1, even without the 7 to 3 or the team care arrangement. So it's a really ha um, helpful item to be mindful of. So I've um, included a list here of all the uh, team members of different health professionals who could be included as part of this team care arrangement. So it obviously includes um, professionals such as chiropractors, Aboriginal um, health workers, diabetes or asthma educators. Very important to, to remember that the practice nurse, if the practice nurse is just providing services on behalf of the clinic so, uh, or on behalf of the GP, like triaging, stock management, even providing these 10997 items, uh, they're seen as an extension of the GP. They're not seen as uh, one of the two external minimum providers for a team care arrangement. So practice nurse, as a general rule, not one of the two um, additional members. But uh, if you have a nurse who's a you know, diabetes educator or an asthma educator, then they're, they're fine. They can be counted. So again, dietitians, exercise physiologists, mental health workers, occupational therapists, and the list goes on. Also included there, pharmacists um, are allowed, as, as long as they're not just simply dispensing medication. So with pharmacists, if you've got a pharmacy who's involved in home medicine reviews, or you might have, um, again, remembering that this is, this is about input into the care of the patient in an ongoing relationship, not just you know one-off or filling a script and not really having any um, type of comment or care. Um, into the management of that condition. So pharmacists, only if they're uh, fairly involved on an ongoing basis, for example, as part of home medicine reviews. Other providers who can be included, which often comes as a surprise to a lot of people, is home and community service providers, um, Meals on Wheels um, providers. Again, as long as you're able to get that agreement from them in that communication and input into the the plan personal care workers probation officers work hover rehabilitation case managers and even fitness instructors or personal trainers again as long as they are contributing to the plan uh, they're not going to have any medicare funding um, because obviously these are all funded uh, through other um, sources but if they are happy to participate and provide input into the care of the patient and obviously if the patient agrees the patient always has to agree for these providers to be engaged and involved um, then you can actually put them as um, part of the team and as we mentioned with specialists very important that you can include specialists as part of the the team but only one will count towards the minimum two um, to create that core um, team for the team care arrangement. Now, the form that we use for the referrals, it's, uh, it's available through the Medicare website. It's also usually comes supplied with all the clinical softwares. And it's the form that includes um, spaces where you can allocate how many sessions 
you would have per, uh, per discipline. So if I'm going to send this form to a podiatrist under the podiatry box, I would say how many sessions has the patient decided to allocate to that service. So we might only say two or three, or it might be all five. One uh, technique or trick that some clinics uh, employ to ensure, to motivate the patient to come back into the clinic for reviews and things like that, is that they'll only ever allocate one to two uh, sessions per time that they fill out the referral because again it, it then motivates the patient to come back into the clinic and have their review or whatever it is so that they can get their referral for additional sessions so it's almost like withholding um, withholding the goods for a little bit just to make sure that they they systematically are coming back and um, being seen for their for their reviews um, very important that you can only really use the form one referral form per discipline don't use one form to say, you know, on one form you should only have one of the disciplines with a number next to it. Don't have three, two, one for the different um, spaces. Just one referral form per discipline. If you put in the, in the area for the allied health, if you identify the name of the allied health, but you also say the practice address um, or the name of that. So for example, if it's a phys physiotherapist, there's physio clinics. If you identify the name of the physio clinic and you have their address, that referral is actually valid for any, any physiotherapist in that, from that clinic. So it's not limited to just the one that's been written, um, just the name of that physiotherapist. If you only put the name of that physio there, then that referral is limited to just that particular person. All right. So it's important to know that you don't actually have to, uh, especially when you're looking at clinics or things like that, you don't have to talk to the individual physiotherapist to, to establish that two-way communication and agreement for the team care arrangement. If you have places like, for example, community health centers, they have a central intake. And in that central intake, that person is actually able to have the conversation with you about the services that the patient could could access and for what, yeah? So it could be, oh yeah, fantastic. We can um, put them in with a podiatrist for these, um, for these things and then we can allocate them to the diabetes educator for these things. So that actually would count as that um, input and two-way communication and you would just document that in the plan and that would be enough, okay? Now let's have a quick look because there's a lot of questions often around how the allied health referrals work and when I need to print a new referral and when I need to, um, yeah, when do the five sessions get reset? So it's always good to, to cover a bit of a, um, uh, uh, an overview or have a refresher. So here we have an example of two calendar years. So we have the top is 2015 the year 2015 from January to December. And at the bottom, we have the year 2016 from January to December. So say around August, we have a patient who comes in and they have, we identify they're diabetic, they don't have a plan in place. We identify that it would be a good idea to put a plan in place. So we create, say in August, a 7 to 1 and 7 to 3. This is August 2015. Um, 7 to 1, 7 to 3 plan for this patient. From that moment on, Medicare now goes fantastic. From now, I will, I will pay up to five allied health services in this calendar year, yeah? so until the 31st of December. So if we have a look at that, um, we might fill out the referrals. Say we gave um, the patient was seeing an endocrinologist and they just wanted to use all their allied health sessions with the podiatrist. So they just give me five for the podiatrist, okay? So we gave five, a referral for five sessions for the podiatrist from, this is from August. Now, they only managed to get in to see the podiatrist four times in that calendar year, so before the 31st of December. And now imagine that the year has gone over to 2016. And now it's um, January of 2016. As soon as the year, clicks over to the 1st of January, Medicare wipes the slate clean and goes, okay, fantastic. If I can look back and there is a 7 to 1, 7 to 3 in place over the last two years, I'll happily pay for five sessions or up to five sessions for this calendar year. So come the 1st of January, it goes, okay, I will give you, you've got another five that I will pay for, yeah, up to obviously the 50, I think it's $52 mark. Say so the, the allied health professional 
can only really provide services as per that the numbers that you put in that in that form. So if you give a podiatrist um, only three, like the authority to provide three, in, in theory, they should not provide more than three because that's all that they've been authorized to do under this um, team care arrangement. But sometimes it still does happen that, you know, Allied Health might lose count and they'll provide more sessions than they should, which is a, an audit uh, issue at their end. Not really your responsibility from or our responsibility from general practice, but just be mindful that it does happen. So if as a podiatrist, for example, the podiatrist was given a referral for five sessions, the patient in the last calendar year only saw them four times. Technically, that referral is still valid. That referral is going to be valid for you know, a good 12 months, like every other referral. That referral still has one authority for a service left in it. So the podiatrist could use that one session that they've got left at the start of January. Now keep in mind that even though this is from a referral from the year before, this now counts as the first session of the five that this patient is going to be reimbursed for for this year. Yeah? So it would be after this that then the, the podiatrist would go, I need you to go back to the GP and get me another five sessions or four sessions or whatever. Keep in mind that here, the podiatrist might go, I need you to go get me five sessions, go get a referral and authority for more for another five. Even if the podiatrist get an authority for another five, Medicare will only pay another four until 31st of December. So if the patient has any more services, they're going to be out of pocket or the podiatrist is going to be out of pocket or someone will be out of pocket because Medicare will not pay for that beyond five in any calendar year period. So is it our responsibility to track how many sessions they've had or they haven't had? Not really. Uh, this is where I say it's very important to put the, um, the onus back on the patient. Um, obviously, the allied health shares some responsibility, but the patient can actually check. They can call Medicare and check how many sessions have I got left? How many have I used? So they can call the, the, uh, the patient line, the consumer line, and, um, and check with their Medicare card. Go, you know, I'm, I just want to check how many sessions I've had left and it's really then up to them. Um, so you don't really have to worry. You can keep um, filling out referrals for as many sessions as the patient wants. Just remembering to always teach them that it doesn't matter what I write on this referral. Medicare is only ever going to pay up to five in any calendar year period. Very important. So hopefully that clarifies um, how this works a little bit more. The reason why it's really confusing is because all the allied health services, so all of the, the podiatry services, physio services, even the nurse consult services, the, the 10997, um, they're all calendar year based. Whereas the GP um, items like the 721, 723 and the reviews and all of those, they're not based on calendar year, they're from the date that you claim them. So if we created a brand new plan in August, for the 721723 and we're saying a brand new plan should be created or it's recommended to be created every 24 months. Medicare will pay it from 12 months but really it's expected that you'll be reviewing it in between and only creating a new plan at 24 months. That's 24 months from the day that we claimed the that we did the original plan. Same with the reviews. So if we did a review in August it would be six months or three months from August, regardless of where the calendar year is sitting. So I know that's confusing and that's where a lot of people struggle to kind of wrap their head around it. But just remember the GP items are six months, three months, 12 months, 24 months from the day that we claim it. And all of the allied health services are based on calendar year. That's hopefully a, an easier way of um, remembering that. The, one of the exceptions that we have in terms of the, or not an exception, but these are additional services that patients with type 2 diabetes can benefit from. Patients with type 2 diabetes can actually access uh, group services. Um, this is type 2 diabetes groups. And these are services that are provided by diabetes educators, exercise physiologists, and dietitians. And it includes, there's two sets. It includes an individual assessment initially and that's where they would actually identify you know, the particular needs of the patient, whether or not they're going to be suitable for a group. And then there's, um, yeah, and then there's the eight group um, sessions that they would have after that. 
Now, these group services are at least 60 minutes long. Um, it, the group needs to be between 2 to 12 people. Patients can have, as we said, up to eight group services per calendar year. Again, that's from the 1st of January to the 31st of December. Um, and, and, and a patient can actually participate in up to two um, group services per day. So they might actually have a group service in the morning with the um, dietitian and then attend an afternoon um, session with the exercise physiologist, for example. It can be a bit tricky to find providers in your area who run these, but as I said, the only three types of providers who do um, run these groups are diabetes educators, exercise physiologists, and dietitians. So it's a good idea to check with your close, your, your providers near you, um, whether or not they run groups and at what times and um, how it works. So again, this is only for patients with type 2 diabetes. Uh, and the other advantage of this is that the patient only needs to have a GP management plan. Again, they don't have to have a TCA or team care arrangement to be able to um, access these services. Nine times out of ten, though, are diabetic patients because there's so many allied health services um, and it's really a team, uh, it really requires a team approach to, to comprehensively look after a patient with diabetes. So nine times out of ten, patients with diabetes will have a GP management plan, seven to one, and a team care arrangement, seven to three. So that wraps up the Medicare items for the care of patients with diabetes. Um, as a quick review, we looked at GP management plans, item 721, looked at team care arrangement, item 723, uh, the review items, which is item 732, and which we can claim twice on the same day if we're indeed um, reviewing both elements. We also looked at the nurse uh, support and monitoring item 10997, which we can claim up to five times in any calendar year period, and some of the trickier or more common questions around how the allied health referrals work. Now let's look at the diabetes cycle of care. The diabetes incentive is also known as the diabetes cycle of care and aims to encourage GPs to provide effective management of people with diabetes. A practice must be accredited or register for accreditation against the RACGP standards for general practice in order to be eligible for any of the PIP incentives. There are three types of payments under the diabetes incentive. There's a sign-on payment of $1 per swipey or standard whole patient equivalent. And this is a one-off payment for practices that use a patient register and a recall and reminder system for their patients with diabetes. There's an outcomes payment of $20 per diabetic swipey, um, which is for practices where at least 2% of practice patients are diagnosed with diabetes and GPs have completed the diabetes cycle of care for at least 50% of these patients. And there's a service incentive payment of $40 per patient per year. This is a payment to GPs for each cycle of care completed. Now this is paid when a diabetes specific Medicare item number is claimed and when the minimum requirements of the cycle of care have been met. As a general guide, the average full-time GP has a swipey value of around 1,000 standard whole patient equivalents each year. The number of patients in a practice with established diabetes is based on the number of patients, or based on the SWIPE, um, who have had an HbA1c test in the last two years. Now let's look at the minimum requirements of the annual diabetes cycle of care, which needs to be completed over a period of at least 11 months and up to 13 months. We need to assess diabetes control by measuring HbA1c, at least once in this 11 to 13 month period. The patient must have had a comprehensive eye examination, um, which means this is at least once over the last two years or over the current and previous cycle of care. We need to measure height and weight and calculate BMI on the patient's first visit and weigh them at least twice more. Measurement of blood pressure at least twice, examining the feet at least twice, measure of total cholesterol, triglycerides, and HDL cholesterol at least once, test for microalbuminuria at least once, measurement of the patient's EGFR at least once. We need to provide self-care education. We need to review the diet. We need to review levels of physical activity. We need to check their smoking status and encourage patients to stop smoking if applicable. We need to review their medication, and this should happen at least once as part of the cycle. Now, note that activities that are needed twice in a cycle must be performed at least five months apart. The best way to record and track these components is by following a consistent practice process. 
It's worth discussing this process with the practice team as part of a practice meeting, which also offers an opportunity to discuss what's working, what could be improved, and it helps to gain consensus and buy-in from all staff. One of the most important things to keep in mind when implementing diabetes management initiatives is having a robust recall and reminder system. In our clinic, we use a smart recall and reminder technology that automates the process based on practice preferences, making recalls much quicker and saving the practice on patient mailouts, which can be expensive and time consuming and much more difficult to track. Now, the system that we, that we use um, sends a secure, privacy compliant mobile message that includes a three point identity verification. This is before any patient information is revealed. Because the message allows the patients to immediately make an appointment, either make an appointment online or by calling the practice from the, within the message, we've also seen a considerable increase in the number of appointments made following one of these smart recall notifications. Now, I've included a link to a full walkthrough of how that works um, if you're interested and it's as part of the resources in this module. Now, I've also included in the resources a template, a clinical template that can be used as both a care, care plan template and also a tracking aid or prompt for the components of the cycle of care. Many clinics struggle with recruitment of patients to attend the clinic for management plan appointments and for other health promotion activities. Over the past 10 years, I've worked with many clinics, trialing and tweaking different approaches to see what works best. Now let's start with the most common issues or what doesn't work so well. By far, the most common mistake I come across is poor communication with patients. This means that the practice is either not using the right method to let patients know of their initiative, for example, may not be using posters in the waiting room or may not have patient fact sheets to promote these initiatives. Um, also, they may not be featuring um, these initiatives as part of the practice website or on the on-hold message of the practice phone system, which are all then missed opportunities. Or it could also be because the language used to promote these initiatives is not patient friendly, meaning it's written in medical jargon or copied and pasted from a Medicare page, which is going to be written in government format and with a tone that can be a bit alienating. Another mistake I see is not communicating the value of the initiative to the patient in a way that they see as beneficial. To illustrate this, here are two care plan invitation paragraphs which I'd like you to have a look at and select which one do you feel patients would respond to best. Here's sample one. If you have a chronic or terminal medical condition, your GP may suggest a GPMP. If you also have complex care needs and require treatment from two or more other healthcare providers, your GP may suggest TCAs as well. Your GP or practice staff must obtain your agreement before providing these plans. If a provider accepts the Medicare benefit as full payment for these services, there will be no out-of-pocket cost. If not, you will have to pay the difference between the fee charged and the Medicare rebate. And here's sample two. Our records show that you're eligible for a new care plan. Creating a care plan gives us the opportunity to discuss your health needs, agree on key goals, and help you track your progress. You may also be eligible for Medicare funding towards services like exercise physiology, dietetics, and physiotherapy, among others. So between those two ways of communicating management plans to patients, which do you feel would be more successful? In my experience in practice, we found the second sample, um, which was much more approachable and patient-friendly, to engage patients better and to encourage them to attend the clinic. The first paragraph was copied and pasted from the Medicare patient fact sheet, and the second paragraph is actually taken from one of the sample templates that comes supplied with the smart recall system that we use. So in summary, it's important that the method and language we use to promote these initiatives are patient friendly and that they highlight the value of the initiative to the patient. All right, so now let's have a look at the practice process um, to recruit patients. And what I like to do is I have a 12 month plan whenever I go into a clinic and I'm looking to set up the, um, say a diabetes clinic or set up the chronic disease or care planning component um, of a practice. So the first step is to make sure that we prepare the practice. What do I mean by that? I mean, we look at um, how are we get, gonna communicate um, that we have these initiatives to the patients, making sure that we have posters or signs in the waiting room to promote the diabetes care plan or um, the cycle of care. We also wanna make sure that the nurse or GP times have been 
allocated and then we actually have consulting rooms available for this service to take place. It's not really appropriate um, to try and, and do diabetes care plans or diabetes cycle of cares as part of everything else in the, in the clinic in terms of trying to um, have that conversation in a corner of the treatment room. Or um, it's, it's really uh, important to make sure that we protect that time and that we actually have adequate space um, with right privacy and confidentiality um, for those conversations to happen. We also want to make sure that all staff are aware of you know, our diabetes care planning and our cycle of care initiatives so that if, you know, if we send out um, an invitation to a patient to come in for a diabetes care plan um, and they ring the practice because they want to make an appointment, we want to make sure that the receptionists understand the requirements of, of that, that it's not just a standard consultation, that it might be you know, a 30 minute appointment or it might be a longer appointment um, and that it might only really be with certain um, staff members, it might only be certain GPs who are participating in that or it might require a, a session with the nurse first, followed by the GP afterwards. We need to make sure that we've agreed on the templates. So this is you know, what template we're gonna to use to invite or what content we're gonna to use to invite the patient. This is either gonna be you know, as a, in a form of a letter or it might be a, a secure notification as I was talking about before with the smart recall system. Um, the care plan template, there's often so many different uh, templates that are used in the clinic where you have, there's no consistency between patients as to what the layout of a, of a care plan is going to look like. That makes it more difficult for all staff involved and for any staff to be able to review and, and manage that care. Uh, referral forms, making sure that we, we update the address book. So we include the most up-to-date details of um, allied health providers. Um, and any patient handouts, making sure obviously we do have patient handouts, these should be written in a patient-friendly way. We also um, look at um, doing a database search. So this is, we'd be looking at a list of active patients with diabetes, and this can be done in a couple of ways. Some people use um, clinical audit tools like the PEN um, audit tool or the Canning um, audit um, tool. You can also use your clinical software, the built-in search uh, parameters, and just look up everyone who's got the condition of diabetes. We also then need to determine Medicare eligibility of these patients. So usually you can either ring Medicare, the provider line, and you can check up to seven patients per phone call, uh, or you can use the Medicare online, the um, HPOS, the Health Professionals Online um, Services, um, to check eligibility for 721s, 723s. So usually when I ring Medicare, I will ask if the patient is eligible for a 721 and a 723 today, yes or no. They shouldn't really tell you, oh, look, if you just wait three weeks, they'll be eligible again. They should only really be able to tell you, yes, no, they're eligible today. Sometimes you get someone on the phone who is happy to say, oh, look, you know, they've had this many sessions or, um, or yeah, if you claim it in two weeks, they'll be fine. Um, not usually the case. Um, if they say, no, they're not eligible to have this done today, then the following question is, okay, are they eligible for a 732, 732? So that's the review item. Um, because they might have had that care plan uh, claimed either at our clinic, although you'd hope that if it was at our own clinic, we'd actually have that recorded and they'd be in the recall system for whenever they do for a review. But it often will happen that they might have had the plan claimed at another clinic. Um, and this could mean that you know if, if they're really, if we're the usual GP for this practice, which is another important thing, only the usual GP or the usual clinic should be claiming these items. Um, so if we're the usual GP in the usual clinic and the patient wants to come see us for their ongoing diabetes management, then um, we could start then taking over the services from now on. So we're looking after their new plans and their reviews and all this. So it's, it's a good idea to check if they're eligible for 732, 732, because it also gives you an indication of how long ago that original plan or the last review might have been done. So if, if they say that they, yes, they're eligible for a review, it means that it's been at least three months since the last item was claimed. Now we want to make sure once we go through this and once we check you know, what patients are going to be eligible for, for what, um, we want to flag those patients so that, um, so that we can invite them proactively or opportunistically if they're coming in for other reasons and we have it highlighted on their file um, 
or you know, under the warnings or an action that pops up on the screen that says that remember to offer a care plan to this patient or invite them for a care plan. Now, the, as I said in our clinic, we use a smart recall system to both invite patients, but also for the ongoing uh, review of them. But I also find if you're not using that, if you're using your, your, your stock standard, sending out letters and that kind of stuff, um, then what works best is to send out a letter and follow it up with a phone call about a week uh, later. If you just call them, sometimes they can feel like you're a telemarketer and they sort of feel a bit like it came out of nowhere um, and you don't may not get as good a response. If you just send the letter, sometimes you actually don't get that good of a response um, in and of itself. Because um, people might see the letter and might go, oh yeah, that could be a good idea, I'll, I'll call and book uh, later on. So if you are doing the old school letter way, then it's letter, try and follow it up with a phone call at least a few days um, later when you know that they've, they've actually received it, hopefully. Because letters do get lost in the mail. So it does happen. But at least it gives you a conversation point of, we sent you a letter in the mail, did you receive it? Yes, no, okay, this is what it was talking about, let's book an appointment. Next step is how we book that appointment. So we need to decide if they're going to be allocated to see the nurse for the nurse first, if the nurse is going to be involved. Um, and this might be consultation with the nurse for 20 minutes or 30 minutes or even longer, um, depending on the complexity of, of the patient. Stock standard is usually a 30 minute appointment with the nurse, followed by a standard consultation with the GP. And making sure obviously that the, the consultation with the GP is booked either immediately after or if it needs to be done on a separate day because maybe the nurse and that GP don't work on the same day then you have to let patients know that this is going to be needing to take place over two consultations and over two separate days so that they're prepared beforehand um, and it doesn't come as a shocking surprise going no what are you telling me they now have to come back and so make sure that it's, it's about communication and it's about obviously um, letting patients know beforehand so that they are on board and they understand um, the process. Now, once a patient is seen, it is extremely important to remember to add them to that recall database um, so that you can follow them up as required. The, it's very, very easy for people to forget to add them to the recall database. A really good strategy is to actually try and book that follow-up appointment with them now. So I might say, okay, so we're going to have to review all of this again in six months' time or three months' time. I actually would like to see you again. And this is as a nurse, when I'll be using an item 10997, I'd like to see you again in two weeks or three weeks because I want to check and see how you've gone with whatever we agreed as part of that consultation. So it might be um, increasing their physical activity or looking at uh, improving their diet a little bit or something that they've identified that they can start working on. Um, and I find that patients really do appreciate this because it is one of the biggest success indicators whenever you look at lifestyle modification is having that support um, to someone to help keep them accountable. It's also, it, it helps with, um, with motivation. So if you can have that and you set it up, uh, obviously it helps build the relationship as well. So you can set it up like that and you actually book that appointment from now um, and they've got it in their calendar and then they're booking around it. Um, it's much more powerful and I, I, at least in practice I've found that you have a better um, response rate. And don't be um, afraid to book you know, appointments three months in advance or six months in advance because it just means that then if they're seeing it in their calendar, they've, they've got that in mind, like, oh that's right, and they book things around it. So you often have a better way of um, engaging them. Um, yeah, and don't be scared. Like often with dentists, we'll book things three months in advance, six months in advance. So it's, 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 not, a, it's not a big issue. Okay? Now, the other thing that I'll do is I'll review the progress of this 12 month plan. So when I've, the, the list that I originally printed and I checked eligibility for all me, for all my, my um, patients, um, I will check the progress of that list at three months, six months and nine months. So I won't print out a new list every time. I'll actually work from my original list um, and I'll only print out a brand new list after 12 months have happened. And then I'll do a brand new 12 month plan from then on. The Priority order, this is my own personal approach, is when I've got my list of all my diabetic patients, I'll give priority to those patients who don't have a plan in place. So the ones that need their first 721 and 723 in place. Then I'll go after the patients who are due for a review or a lot of times who are overdue for a review because they were never put in the recall database, they were never told that they needed to come back for a review. So this is a great opportunity to then start inviting them. 
And then third, I will go into all the patients who have had either new plans or reviews fairly recently. So they're not really ready. It's not yet time for a new for a review or not time for a new plan. So I'll go into those files and check that again, if I've got time and check that the recalls are in place for the right time intervals yeah, that I haven't or another provider hasn't forgotten to add those recalls because um, that's how often um, patients fall through the cracks. And then after 12 months, start again. So the idea is to do a 12 month plan, obviously every 12 months. So I hope that is um, helpful. Uh, I hope you found that beneficial. And um, if you've got any questions, feel free to send us a, um, an email and we'll try and assist from then on. Everyone's got their specialties. So you don't expect a doctor to be able to prescribe exercise or diet or anything like that. They don't have time. So I think each person has their area of specialty. You've got a diabetes educator dealing with theirs, diet, EPs dealing with theirs. It will make the information more specific, more customised, rather than just generic, which makes the plan a lot better. Um, easier to follow as well, because you know if there's injuries to have, an exercise physiologist is going to create a plan better for that person. Um, whereas for diet, you're customising exactly what you need. Find that works a lot better if each person specialises in something to be able to create a more rounded plan for that person. Um, and, and making sure they go to them all as well, I guess is the other thing. It's very important to work as part of a multidisciplinary team because nobody has got all the knowledge that is necessary to deal with a complex situation. So whether it's a podiatrist working on the feet, whether it's an optometrist or an ophthalmologist looking at the eyes, nurses and nurse educators treating a very complex condition, everybody adds value to the equation and as a result, you get a good outcome. GPs, doctors in general, are very busy and have timeline issues. And being able to share the load for a complex uh, chronic disease is very valuable, especially with other high quality professionals who have their own unique view of the situation. Okay, so diabetes, because of the way it is, um, it's got so many complications and risk factors. We know that with pre-diabetes people come and they've already got complications. So you need a team. You need a podiatrist who specialises with feet, obviously. You need a dietitian who can talk to them about food, see where they're at, give them advice. You need an eye doctor, ophthalmologist, optician to look after their eyes. There's a whole team, so it's really important. It's just not one person. It's everybody working together.